Good morning, church. Love it. I love that you're excited. My name is Josh Egler. I'm one of the worship leaders here, and I am so fired up right now. Have you guys ever had, like, really good news you wanted to tell someone, but, like, a text wasn't going to cut it, phone call wasn't going to do it, like, it had to be in person? Right? Anybody? Okay, good. (laughs) Because that's me right now. I wrote this sermon, like, two weeks ago, and I have been waiting patiently to see all of you so I could give it to you. God has a special word for us this morning, and so I'm going to do my best to be faithful to him and to honor him and what he's got in store. So just so I know you guys are ready, because I didn't come ready to preach a sermon that y'all were just going to kind of snooze in, why don't you turn to three people in your row and say, I'm ready. All right. That's good. We, we ready. We ready. So because we're ready, we're going to dive right into it. We're going to get right into the text this morning. Um, We're going to be in Samuel 16.1. So you can go ahead and get your Bibles there right now. Um, And in a moment, we're going to jump into that text. But before we do, I'd like to kind of tee this up with a story. So a little over six years ago, I was in San Diego. I was 18 years old. I was in a parking garage, and I was crying my eyes out. It was just me. And I was punching my steering wheel. I was just so upset. I was so frustrated. I was trying to comprehend the cruelty of the world. I had just found out that my brother had been bullied. He was struggling at school. And I was just blaming myself like any brother would. I was frustrated, right? It didn't make any sense. How can we live a wor- in a world where we just allow these things to go on? Not kind of unlike what's going on nowadays, right? We watch these things and we struggle with How do we have a God that's so good, but but how do we have these things that are so hard? It was crushing me. It was so difficult. Now, it's important to kind of tell you guys, my life looked a lot different. Like I said, I was 18 years old, so I've aged a bit, hopefully well. Um, I was Jewish at the time, never had set foot in a church, ever. My life was filled with tension and anxiety and change. I was about to go to college very soon. I had just moved, graduated high school, transitioned to California, and then was about to go to D.C. in a city I'd never been to, with people I'd never met. But amidst this tension and uncertainty, someone was waiting patiently for me. There was a breakthrough, and he was just waiting for me to take one step forward. And his name is Jesus Christ. See, earlier in that month, I met a girl. All good stories start that way, right? Started with a girl, right? (laughs) Spoiler alert, I'll get to the end of that. She's my wife. She's sitting here right now. Um, So, yeah, round of applause. Great wife. And this this girl, this wonderful girl, she started inviting me to church. So I'm an 18-year-old boy, and I'm like, okay, so if church equals spending more time with her, then to the church we shall go. (laughs) You know, I'm sitting in there, and I'm, I'm writing things down like, Peace be with you. That's a good word. Yeah, what did you think of that? Like, that song, the one about the, the thing, like, that was, that moved in me. Lots changed, like I said, not that way anymore. But I walked into that church week in and week out with the thought that I was just spending time with a girl I liked. And one day, amidst my anxiety, my self-righteousness, my pride, and my greed, I gave my life to Christ. Something changed that day. And forever forward from that point, my breakthrough has saved my life. I'm not going to tell you that it was easy. I'm not going to tell you that those feelings hadn't stopped. But it was the first step. It was the beginning of my transition. Now, a lot of you guys know me today because you see me back there. And I'm smashing away on the symbols. And you're like, who is that behind that glass? Like, what's he doing back there? That's me. My name is Josh. Um, But for me, music and worship has always been something that has been so special because music does this thing that words can't. Music connects us to God in a way that I couldn't preach this sermon. I couldn't read scripture the way that worship and being in connection with God through music can make you feel. And so what we're going to do to tee this sermon series up, and so a lot of people have alluded to it, I thought I was going to be coming in fresh and be like, and it is transitions, and you guys be like, oh my gosh, wow, I didn't know. But you've heard it a couple times now, so spoiler alert, it's transitions, and what does that look like? And so I have the honor of kicking it off, but in order to do that, I want to use a music illustration, if you would. So play with me for a second. So we have Brian back here on the keys. He's awesome. And we're going to walk through some, yeah, give us, give us a shout of praise for him. And so I asked Brian, 
probably about 25 minutes ago to help me with this, so he's really, really prepared. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the way music transitions. Music is all about how we transition from one point to the other. But we can't just start from the beginning of the song, right? We start playing, Eric starts playing, you guys are into it, and then we just end. You guys would be like, well, what happened? Like, I was just ready to sing that bridge. I, I just figured out what that lyric was. I'm ready to praise. There's something that has to occur from, from point A to point B. So I'm going to have Brian play this first note for a second. He's just going to hold it. Ah, right? That beginning of the song. It's a sweet sound, right? Something that you guys can all say, hmm, I might like this song. I don't know where it's going, but this makes me happy. And we're going to transition to the second note. Ooh, what's that? There's something up inside me right now. I feel like there's some tension, right? Now you have my interest. First I was kind of like, hmm, this song's interesting. But now I have this, this, this note that, that makes me feel like there's something more. We can't end here, right? Otherwise you guys would be throwing tomatoes at us like, this song is horrible. Where's the completion? Where's the resolution? And so then we get, right? What just happened in your heart? You went from, okay, I like this, to, okay, hurry up and get to the end, to finally, you feel complete. And that's the way that we're gonna do this transitional series. So thank you, Brian, for doing that for me for a second. So let's give another pants for him. <laughs> we see our lives in transition, and they just feel incomplete. They're tense. You feel anxious, like, I can't stand transition. Like, I, I liked where I was at. But, but now I'm over here, and it's weird, and it's unfamiliar, and I can't, I can't make sense of it all. And it builds, and it builds, and it builds, and it builds, and then <laughs> breakthrough, release. That transition is complete, and, and we move past it. We don't live in that space anymore. And so the Bible is just filled with transitions. There are so many examples, so much we can learn from, from God's word, of, of people being carefully shepherded, from that beginning of that song, through that transition, that incomplete feeling, to their resolution. And so we're going to look to our Bibles, and we're going to read in 1 Samuel. So let's everybody turn there, and I'm going to read aloud. For some reason, I brought my really tiny Bible without my glasses, so if I miss a word, just laugh for me, and I'll know I'm doing the right thing. Um, so the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. God chooses. God chooses when you move into transition. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint the one that I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived in Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? And Samuel replied, yes, in peace I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the anointed one stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. It's about the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, and just as he had passed in front of Samuel, Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema pass by, and Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are, all the sons, are these all the sons you have? And Jesse responded with, there's still the youngest. He's tending to the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. Love the urgency. So he sent for him and had brought him in. He was glowing with health, and he had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David, and Samuel returned to Ramah. If you could bow your heads and pray with me for a second. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. God, thank you that you reveal your nature to us in scripture and in worship. Father, I pray that we would receive you today, God, that we would come expectant for you to move. And Father, I just ask that you would lift everyone up in here 
and that we would all just dig deep and challenge ourselves this morning. Amen. And so at this moment, David was the king of Israel, in God's eyes, but the world looked a little different, right? See, he was anointed on that day, but he wasn't appointed yet. Saul was still on the throne, even though David had just been anointed. So here was David, he's at his point A. He knows where he's going, but there's this whole space here, right? And so David found himself in transition. He was transitioning from something greater, from a state of glory to glory. When I met my wife, Anna, I was surely in transition. <laughs> I remember when we met, I thought I had it all figured out. My parents are about to get a chuckle out of this, because they know. I would, uh, I would look to them as an 18-year-old, I'd be like, look guys, fantastic job on the whole parenting thing. Like A to B, it was great. Like you guys taught me everything I know, but, but I'm 18 now. And, and I got it all figured out. Like I've, I've learned everything I need to learn. Uh, I'm a man, and I'm gonna charge out there and figure it out. Some of you are laughing because you either have a teenager and you're like, goodness, that's my life. Or you were a teenager, which a lot of us were, and you remember what that felt like. But nobody tells you that that's not exactly how it goes, right? I still call my parents every single day, and I'm like, hey, so I'm trying to fill out this mortgage application, and the only fields I understand are first and last name. Uh, can one of you come over here and assist me? So I, I'm still in this transition of being a whole independent adult thing. I, I think it might take my entire life, so somebody pray for me, please. Um, <laughs> But uh, when Anna and I met, I, I was deceived by what I thought was my resolution. See, I had already transitioned out of high school. I had gone through a lot of things, the loss of a grandparent. Uh, my life was pretty hard at that point. But then I met this awesome girl, and I was like, well, I'm 18, I'm going to college, met a great girl, on for the rest of my life. Nothing bad can happen to me now. This is my pinnacle, like I peaked, right? <laughs> Everything down here. I'm, I'm going downhill from this point. But, but, but life has a funny way of, of being fine until one day you wake up and it's just not. And it's really hard. And you get that feeling in your chest and, and you have that weight on your shoulders and, and you don't understand what's going on. You're like, I, I was just fine like yesterday, but now I'm walking through this season of life and it's crushing me. And some of you in here, you're, you're living that day over and over again. Some of you are in transition, you don't even realize it. You don't even realize that your life is, has still got more years to go. Some, some of you in here have come to terms with the fact that your life is just going to be okay. That you're going to wake up every single day and that, that this is it. That there's nothing left for you. And, and that to me is, is where I just get to say, that's a lie. That's a complete lie. And you want to know what else is a lie? I compete in triathlons. That's a lie. In case you didn't know, <laughs> newsflash, tell all your friends, I did not, will not, can't not, have not, won't not, did not, do, ever did, done, slash will do a triathlon. I mean, come on, right? Like, I'm in the water, I got like a thousand people like trying to swim over top of me, pushing me down. Like, I'd get to the beach, right, to get to the bikes, and I'd be like, Lord Jesus, like, I'm done. Like, you, I don't need to get on that bike to go to heaven, like, you could take me now, like, just let's go. Like, let me get the bags off and let's, let's go up there right now. And if by the grace of God, like, I got on the bike, like somehow I put my shoes and my helmet on, it would have to be downhill, because I'm not pedaling up any hills after that point. And then even if I got to the marathon portion, I'd be like, somebody just put my shoes on, I, just, I don't know where I am, like, please help, like, somebody help me out. But you wanna know that the really interesting thing about transitions is, well not transitions, gave it away, shoot. Triathlons, <laughs> one of the most overlooked aspects of the triathlon is the transition. What you do between each event is so important that some people actually fail to complete the triathlon because of how they failed to prepare or got distracted in the transition. I talked to Beth Pierpont, and I see Chris here, but I don't see Beth, so she, uh, she'll have to watch online. But Beth is one of the crazy people that does these things and likes them and, and, and completes them. Um, but I was talking to her, I said, what is it like when you're going into the, to that next event? And she said, well, hold up. When I get out of the water, I'm not thinking about the swim, I'm not thinking about the bike. I'm thinking about three things that I have to do. Three simple things. I gotta get my shoes on, I gotta get my helmet on, and I gotta find my bike. She's not worried about what's in the next season over here. She's worried and she's present about her transition. And she is being so intensely focused and productive in that transition, she's not wasting any time. 
She's not wasting any emotional energy. She's not stressed about the bike. She knows, I'll get to the bike. I train to get to the bike. But right now, I have to focus on my transition. I have to make the most of my transition. Because if I don't, things are going to get hard. I'm not going to be ready for this next event. I can't, I can't go from this event to this event unless I transition. And you see, we need to make sure as a church, we're not wasting any time in the transition. We can't be a body of believers who are okay just sitting in transition. You need to be using that because transitions are intentional. They're important because God uses transitions to move us from one season to the next. It's the only way that we can do that. In Luke 16, 10, the Bible says, Whatever, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. If you are faithful, God is going to give you more. Let me just say that again. If you're faithful with what God has given you, he is going to give you more. But see, our God is good, right? He's a father. He's a shepherd. He doesn't want to give you more and then have you fail and laugh in your face. He's a good father. And so what does he do? He prepares us. When we are faithful with little, he prepares us to receive more. And when you say yes to God, he looks at you and says, oh, this girl, this girl's ready. Or this guy, I can trust him. This is a man I can trust. I look to this man and I say, he's ready for transition. Or this girl's ready for this next season. So I'm going to take her into the transition. So we need to start looking as transitions, not as uncertainties in our life, but opportunities to receive more, to receive more of what God is doing. When David was anointed, he was 15 years old. He was in transition for 20 years before he became the king of Israel. He didn't just get the horn of oil and then walk right into the palace and say, excuse me, sir, you're on my seat. I need that because I'm the king, right? God said, no, 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 no. I've given you a calling and I've put this in your life, but there's some things I got to show you before you can get to the, to the throne because there's been a lot of leaders before you and they've done a really bad job and I don't want you to fail because you're in my kingdom and you are my son and I don't let my sons and I don't let my daughters fail. He had to forge his strength and trust and got in the fire. Let me give you a couple cliff notes of that transition. If this was like the NBA Finals and Goliath checked into the game, it would be like Goliath standing nine feet tall with 125 pounds of armor on in a 15 pound tip of his spear, checking into the game to play against little tiny David. This dude was huge, right? And he had to kill him, and that was just the beginning. Like, he conquered and killed the one man that nobody else could take on, the, the hardest, most uncertain challenge, and still David had more to learn. Sometimes we have a breakthrough in our life, and then we get crushed because our transition isn't actually completed yet. That was only just part of it, right? And so he had to forge that in the fire. He became famous after that. They would chant in the streets. The women would be like, mm -mm, Saul, he only killed about 1,000 people, but David, but David... <laughs> He, he, killed, he killed like 10,000 people. I like David, right? They were all about David. And then Saul got a little bit insecure in that moment. And so he cast him out and he hunted him. 12 wilderness stories worth of hunting one man. He was in transition. And as a society, like we're so quick to see tension and hardship as a sign from God that says, stop, 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 turn around. This is not where you're supposed to be. Like, we, we, don't, we don't like to go into that because it's harder, right? Like it, I was fine here. Things were great here. But, like, if I want to get here, I don't want to have to kill a nine-foot dude. Like, and I'm, I'm with you guys. <laughs> if I was asked, hey, Josh, so there's this nine-foot guy, and nobody's been able to kill him, and we want you to take him on. Oh, and by the way, you're going to get uh, some rubber bands and some rocks. <laughs> I'd be like, uh, so what? Rubber bands and rocks? I I'm not killing no nine-foot dude with rubber bands and rocks. I'd be like, I gotta go find that sheep over there. Bye. I gotta go. But David, he, he had trust in the Lord that even though he was only given little, he could expect much in return. 
So how can we be like David, right? Because we look to this and we say, wow, David just crushed it. Like, his transition was long and hard, and people were trying to kill him. Like, I have transitions too, but nobody's trying to kill me. And, like, I don't have to kill large people or, or get famous and then not be famous and have to be in the wilderness. That's not my life. How did David do it so well? If David's transition was so hard, what can, what can I learn from David? How do we navigate our transition and, and make the most of it? It takes three things. I'm going to give them to you one at a time. The first one is a relationship with Jesus Christ. When I was 18, I had what I thought was everything going for me. I was like, oh my gosh, I got into the school I wanted to go to. I'm now living in California. I get to go to the beach and eat burritos. Um, I just met a really pretty girl. Like, I might want to marry her one day. Um, I have a lot of friends. Like, there's so much going on. But I had one thing that I was missing. I didn't have God in my life. And so in order for me to move through my transition, to take the first step, I had to know Jesus so that I could follow him. And David had the same David was characterized in Acts 13, 22. He said, after removing Saul, he made David their king. And God testified concerning him and said, I found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. David, first and foremost, had a relationship with God. Out of everything else that happened, he had so many things going for him at that point, but he had a relationship with God. He trusted him. He sought him out. He was convicted to pursue him. But I want to back up a little bit because relationship is kind of an ambiguous term when it comes to God. We're like, well, does relationship mean like, you know, being right here and like sitting in my church seat? Or is relationship like being on the drums back here? Or is it being in the Sunday school? No, 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 no. It doesn't say, it doesn't say that David was a man after God's Sunday school or time. It said he was after his heart, right? He was after his heart. It's about God's heart. He wanted the things that God wanted. He sought to love the way that God loved. He he, he wasn't occupied with other things. He wanted God's heart, and that was the foundation of his transition. If you want to transition well, if you want to understand meaning from A to B and be prepared to go into your bike or your marathon and your triathlon of life, you have to have a relationship with God. And some of you, some of you, you have that. Some of you, you, you don't know Jesus for the first time, and that's okay, because six years ago, that was me. And God says, the time doesn't matter. I'll find you. And we'll be, we'll be together. And sure did he get me and trust me. And I'm saying, some of you are like, oh, well, God, I don't know about me. You should have seen me. You should have seen me as an 18-year-old. Transitions are easier when we walk through them with God. The second thing that David had, he had a calling for his life. He was anointed And he knew that his appointing would come from that. He had a calling in his life. And so the hardship that he experienced was in context. It made sense because he knew it was in preparation for his future glory. He knew that he had to go through this, no matter how crazy it was, because God put a calling on his life. He put something in his heart and said, this is who I know you to be, and don't worry about what happens between then, because my promises are true. All your promises are yes and amen. We just sang that song. There's a reason it was here today. But we live in a generation that is too preoccupied because David understood his why. Sometimes we're too preoccupied. We're too busy to understand our why. Like, we got bills to pay. Like, I'm trying to be a good father, a good husband. I've got all these things going on. I'm trying to make new friends. Oh, I got to move. Something happened. And, and, And we put our heads down for so long, and we just march. And then we pick our heads up, and we're like, what? This, is, this isn't the place that I thought I was supposed to be. I thought I did everything right. I, I, was, I was chasing after all these things, and, and now I look up and I don't, I don't recognize where I am. I, didn't have, I don't have vision. I don't have direction. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking this, because I struggle with the same thing. Well, Josh, that's great, but like, I, I don't know what my calling is. Like, I, well, some people are called, but like, not, not me. Well, that's not true. You have gifts, right? Some of you are like, oh, here he goes about the gifts, right? But some of you are overthinking this gift thing. The thing that you do, that small thing that you do, that you're really, really good at, that's your gift. That's your gift that fulfills your calling. And it may not be super cool. You may not be able to have all the spotlight. 
but that's what fulfills your purpose, that small thing that you do. Because all God needs is all that you have. Let that resonate. All God needs is all that you have. You don't have to be somebody that you're not. You don't have to try to covet somebody else's gifts because you already have your own. And God wants you to press into that. David had a ton of gifts, and you don't have to be like David. He said he was, he was a guitar player. He was handsome. Like he has to always be handsome. Um, you know, he had the ability to, he was a great warrior. He was motivated. He was a leader. But you don't have to be like David to navigate your transition. You just have to be true to you because David didn't look to other people to get those things. He was true to himself. Your transition is meaningful. Your life is meaningful. And like David, all these gifts that you have fulfill the calling in your life that helps that transition make sense. The last thing is a godly community. It's a godly community. David had community. More specifically, he had, he had Jonathan. He had a brother in his life. And I'm not talking about, when I say godly community, I'm not talking about your besties or that one kid from middle school that you still keep up with. Like, I'm talking about your godly community. I'm talking about people that speak truth into your life. The people that aren't afraid to approach you and say, Josh, you're out of line, man. What you're doing with your life is reckless. God called you to so much more, and you're distracted right now. Who's in your life that can do that? Because David, while David had gifts, and David had a calling, and David surely was walking with the Lord, he still needed Jonathan. Because we can't always see the things that we don't know are behind us, right? Who's got your back? Who's looking out for you? Who in your life is protecting you when you're not around? We need godly community to navigate our transition. Because it's hard, right? Because when we do things alone, the devil starts to come in and goes, hey, did God really say that? And you're like, oh man, did he really? Yeah, I was really fired up about that sermon, but now I'm not sure. And a godly community can come in and say, hey, that's a lie. Let me encourage you. David was in the wilderness for many, many years, and Jonathan encouraged him. When God looked at the world in Genesis, he sat back and he said, that's a, yeah, I'm going to call that good. That is, wow, that's really good. That's some good work I did. And only a few verses later, he looks at the world again and he says, it's not as good as I thought. See, Adam wasn't supposed to be alone on the world. He had all the animals, sure, but we need people. We need godly community in our lives because transition is, is really, really hard. A lot of you are in transition right now, but it's so much harder when you do it alone. And who in here knows what it's like when you have a friend come alongside you and say, hey, I, I see that you're hurting. Like, I know you lost your dad, but like, can I pray for you? What is, who is in your life? We need a generation of Christians that are fired up about transitions that are so excited when things are starting to change because they trust that that next season that God is putting you in is so good and they can't wait to see you secure that glory. All of the things in our lives, from the small moments to the big ones, it all leads up from transition to transition. It's funny, when I, when I write these sermons, a lot of times what happens is like I start to go through the exact thing that I'm preaching on. And so I'll go through, you know, I'll be stressed out. I was in transition this week, this whole deal. And it was a small transition. I had to buy a car. I didn't like buying a car. And I have to preach these things to myself. So I understand what, what it's, what's going on in your life. But so, someone in this room, and God put this on my heart, is on a verge of a breakthrough. And I want to leave you with a story from the book of Joshua. Yes, I know it's my name, but it's still good. I didn't write it. Um, the Israelites came upon the town of Jericho in the book of Joshua. It was heavily fortified. So they were walking through the desert and they're like, who are we gonna get next? Like my God has wiped all these people out. Like who are the next fools that are coming through? And he's walk, they're walking up and they're like, whoa, okay, Jericho. Okay, I didn't expect this. This is really big. So they're like, okay, but we got God. So, so let's huddle up. And so they huddle up and like, God, what's the plan? What's the play? And God's like, you're gonna walk around the city and you're gonna, wait for it, you're gonna blow a horn. And they're like, oh. But no, no spears? Like, no, none of the weapons? And he's like, no, the horns. And they're like, okay, horns it is. Let's do horns. And, and God told them to march around the city. So they, they did their loop. And they hit that horn. And they were like, 
Nothing happened. Okay, well, maybe we didn't do it right. They go back the second day. It doesn't work. And for six days, they walked around the city, and they blew the horns. And I imagine on that sixth day, they woke up, and they're like, it must be me, or maybe God left me. Like, I've been trying so hard to, to do this, to move this obstacle in my life, to navigate this transition, but, but maybe God, what, maybe his promises aren't true. Maybe he's not who he says he is. But on the seventh day, something really interesting happened. They walked around. They were probably discouraged, like a lot of you. Woke up and was just like, whatever, it's just another day. I don't expect anything crazy to happen. But they knew that one thing that God called them to do. And they walked around that city, and they blew those horns, and the walls fell. The walls fell on the city, that thing, that thing in their life that they thought would never change. They were faithful to God, and it fell. Some of you are on day six right now. Some of you are so discouraged that you're living day six over and over and over and over and over and over again. And you don't even realize that you are so close to day seven, that you are so close to your breakthrough, and all you have to do is do what God's already given you. To take what you already have and just be faithful. Because God didn't say go out and find five other things that you don't do well and then bring them back and then I'll give you more. He said if you're faithful with little, that small thing that you do, I will give you more. Our church is in transition. And we've been going through a lot of things. And some of us have come here every single Sunday and it's felt like, oh, another Sunday. What are we doing? What, what, nothing's changing. I'm up there blowing my horn, drum, and, and nothing's changing. But God is faithful, and I trust that he's faithful. And we get to see the conclusion of this transition on July 15th. Cole is coming. He's going to be our pastor. And I have high expectations for him, but I know he's human just like us. But that is our transition completed. So I want to go to God and pray right now. And I would ask that you would bow your head and you would repeat after me as I say these things. Father God, teach me to trust you. Strengthen my heart for the transition. And help me to realize the why. I pray for courage to overcome my Goliath. And patience to wait through my storm. God, thank you for your son for whom all things are possible. In Jesus' name, amen. If you could stand with me and worship, let's give it all to God.